Hi, you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science and Medicine Podcast Award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. We're discussing a topic I don't see talked about enough and certainly not in a personal capacity often when it is talked about, genetic counseling burnout and transitioning to roles outside of the field. Joining me for this conversation is Tiana Rogers and Nira Johnson. Tiana is an aspiring digital designer and board certified genetic counselor with direct patient care experience in prenatal and cancer genetics. She was also in my class at Sarah Lawrence. Um, so that's how we know each other. And Tiana introduced me to Nira. Nira is a genetic counselor turned graphic designer who spent over 10 years in cancer and prenatal genetics, but mostly on the industry side and five years in graphic design. Now, her main goal is making accurate patient and provider focused educational materials, as well as science focused art. And, you know, as I kind of said, Tiana, you come from a more direct patient role and Nira, you have the industry experience. So I think it's really great that you both come from a different background. Um, so thank you both so much for coming on the show and, and sharing your, your personal experiences, but also just being able to have this conversation about the field. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you and, for having us. Yeah, definitely. And and I have I have to show off Nira's work for a moment for people watching the video. If you're not, please go over to the YouTube, at least watch this timestamp of the video. So right here, if the light is working with me, this is gorgeous. So this is Nira's work and she sent me my own and I can't wait to hang it, but I had to wait to hang it so I could show it off during the episode here. Um, and it's really exciting. We're gonna be doing a giveaway um, for something from her Etsy shop. So uh, stay tuned to the end of the episode, or if you can't wait, head over to her social media to check that out. Um, so we will kind of, uh, okay. you know, circle back to that at the end. Um, yeah, I'm but, so glad it came in. Yes, yeah, it was so <laughs> exciting. I was, I was saying before we started recording, it came in on a Friday night and, you know, I just had a long week and it, and it was just the pick me up I needed. I was like, this is <laughs> gorgeous, I love it. Um, and for those that don't know, I work in prenatal, so it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's a cool tie into that. <laughs> um, but most people don't my, you know, story and if they've listened to the show before of kind of coming into the field, but I'd love to hear from each of you in terms of your journey of becoming a genetic counselor and, and what initially attracted you to your roles in the field. Um, because, you know, some people have kind of that standard answer of, you know, I, I love helping people and genetics is interesting and then others kind of have a different spin on it or something. Um, so I don't know who wants to start kind of just telling us a little bit of uh, background of how we got here. Tiana, you go. Here I can first. start first. Oh, it's Tiana. No, <laughs> <laughs> we both tag each other. Oh, no. I can start. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, I, so I do have the typical sort of beginning. Um, you know, I think like most of us, we all love science, right? I've always loved science, you know, um, for as long as I can really remember. And so I actually remember the first time my mom got me my first microscope when I was eight or nine, I think. Oh, so and it's just, it's funny. I have pictures of that too. And I was like, oh, this is the greatest thing. And so I think that kind of where it st all started essentially. Um, and I've always loved art as well. Um, and so I've always gravitated to that um, always. Um, but for the longest time, I've always thought I would be some kind of, you know, doctor, surgeon, something in the medical field. Um, I, I wanted to personally impact people's life, not necessarily just save people's life, but I wanted to have some kind of a difference in the world. Um, and as a kid, I kind of grew up believing that being a doctor is really how you do that. Uh, I don't know if that's one of those sort of programming situation where, you know, parents get you to do that. Oh, you gotta be a doctor, you gotta be a lawyer, right? Um, but that's sort of where, how I grew up. And so when I was in college, there's two things I realized. Number one is that the anxiety that I had about, you know, failing or even about the crazy amount of schooling that it takes um, to get there, and funny enough, I'm saying this now with three different degrees, so it's kind of weird <laughs> to say that, but just knowing how much what I needed to get there, and then also that, you know, the, the fact that you literally have people's lives in your hands gave me a little bit of an overwhelming feeling. So that was the first thing. And then the other was that the love I had for genetics 
um, I had the most incredible mentors and teachers in um, college and something clicked. I don't know what it was. They just made it sound like magic. I, I don't know. And I didn't know even genetic counseling existed at that point. And so one of the professors I had who was very influential in my college life um, sort of pulled me aside one day and introduced me to the existence of this sort of magical world of genetic counseling and sort of put me in touch with a few local GCs um, for me to observe and ask questions and do all that. And the rest is really history. Uh, so that's kind of where it all started for me. Wow. So it was yeah. kind of starting from, all right, think I want to be a doctor to other things exist and that I can yeah. still make a difference and not necessarily be like a surgeon or something along exactly. those lines. Yeah. Exactly. How about you, Tiana? I actually don't think I know the answer to this, despite us being friends <laughs> for years. <laughs> um, it's probably a very traditional answer, I would say. <laughs> so I remember when I was in middle school, there's a documentary that came out on Nat Geo. Uh, that was about the human family tree. So it was basically trying to figure out if we can see genetic ancestry in individuals. So looking for those signatures uh, to determine where people came from in the world. And I thought that that was incredibly fascinating that you can use somebody's genetics to try to figure out those origins. Um, so it's not surprising that when I went to college, I ended up in human evolutionary biology as my undergrad <laughs> degree. Uh, I started off as a bio major and I switched out of that because that required taking physics and I don't like physics, so this is a better fit. Um, so as you can imagine, it's a combination of genetics, evolution, anthropology. And I knew that, you know, I wanted to use that in some way, shape and form because I just found genetics really fascinating. Um, I realized like from intro bio labs that dissecting things was not my jam. So I knew <laughs> medical school was not going to be my place. Uh, and then trying to figure out, okay, do I want to do research instead? Is that an area that I see for myself? And I did some like wet lab uh, background in college, but I didn't necessarily find that like a fulfilling path for me. And so the stock answer of, you know, wanting to help people really came through, but it felt like that that would be a more fulfilling path for me. So the GC path felt more practical for me at that point in time. It was kind of that mesh of what my interests were um, as far as like a knowledge base goes and then trying to combine it with more empathy because I am a very empathetic person. I do care very deeply about people. And, you know, coming alongside them on these journeys, I felt that that was going to be a good blend. Yeah, definitely. And, and I can definitely um, back up that. You're a very empathetic person. And, <laughs> and I, it, that really comes through in terms of just how you interact with people and, and just, you know, really touching base with people and everything and checking in. Thinking about your previous roles, I kind of have a, a two-part question. What was the most rewarding aspects of the job? But then also, what are some challenges you faced when working in Tiana in the clinic, near in, in non-direct patient setting of industry, and also kind of, all right, maybe it's three parts, of like the impact on <laughs> mental health with that too. And yeah. I, you know, I think everybody experiences this to a certain extent, but it really varies depending on people's specific roles. Um, Tiana, do you want to get started this time? Sure. So I, I'll start off by saying that, at least for me, empathy is a double-edged sword. So yes. that, I would say, it's the most rewarding aspect of the job by far, at least for me, in a patient-facing role, because you are helping people. You are directly making an impact and navigating them through some of the most difficult moments of their lives. So it's fulfilling in that regard. Um, but there is a point where it can be too much. And I don't know that I was successful in trying to really establish that solid boundary because it's really hard to do. It's difficult to separate yourself from the experiences of someone else when you are that empathetic. Um, so it, it started to trigger more of my own symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, which is something that I was diagnosed with in college. 
Um, so it, it made it a little bit more difficult and started to lead to feelings of burnout for me. Um, I would say that another rewarding experience of my role in clinic was providing mentorship to people. So whether that was to people that I was working with or students, um, you know, helping them along their journeys and trying to figure out what they wanted to do career wise was really rewarding. I loved doing that. I still love talking to people about their careers, regardless of what they're, you know, looking to get into. Um, mostly it's genetic counseling because that's what my experience is in. <laughs> um, sure. And I will say that maybe another challenge that I faced too was not necessarily having that high degree of support that maybe I was hoping for from healthcare organizations or places of employment. Um, sometimes it felt like there was maybe not so much of an understanding of what exactly this type of role entails, what that day-to-day -day looks like and how emotionally involved it can be. Um, and how best to support me or someone like me through that. I don't know if that was necessarily met in the best way. Yeah, I think that makes sense and an experience that a lot of people are having in, in direct patient facing roles because even in grad school, kind of going back to that, I think grad schools in general, we touch on this, but I think it'd be great if we went yes. deeper into like how to support yourself, but also yeah. like, who to reach out to, how to reach out. Yeah. And it depends. Some people work in very small places. Some people work in huge hospitals. And so, yeah. you know, you'd think the bigger it is, the more support you get, but that's not necessarily mm -hmm. what I've heard from lots of people working in lots of different hospitals in the U S um, can really only speak to the U S but mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's tough. And I, I definitely, you know, resonate with the part about generalized anxiety. You know, I, I have that as well, and I'm on medication for it. I've made a joke on the show that Lexapro should, you know, sponsor this episode because <laughs> could not do the show without my Lexapro in the morning. But, you know, I think it's, it's a really tough aspect in that employers are not necessarily going out of their way or setting up something so that it, it's normalized to be checking in and, and how someone is because yeah. When you're in a counseling position, you kind of need a counselor yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that also should be normalized and everything. Um, Nira, I'm hearing a lot of yes, yes. W what other thoughts <laughs> do you have in terms of maybe the yeah. industry side? So I think I agree with everything. And um, I think, you know, again, the biggest thing for what you essentially to, to piggyback on what you said is the idea that if, if we had something in school to be able to know to expect it right and know that that's something that's maybe even and i don't i can't speak to other you know professions but i can say that again having empathy be such a core part of being a genetic counselor especially patient facing i think that is something that is bound to happen um taking that home that is a big challenge that i've had which i'll, I'll touch on in just a minute but i think having that preparation would have helped but I think honestly, if, if we're starting with rewarding aspects, um, talking about that, I think for me, it's so multifold. It's really hard to, to pimp on. I mean, there's a reason we, we all went into it, right? Uh, we all love genetics, right? There's that sort of scientific and sort of academic part of it. That's always rewarding. There's always something new. It's never boring. Um, that's a big part for me. I get bored really easily. <laughs> so having, being in a field that constantly changes um, was really important for me. And I really feel like I got that and I still do, um, especially these days with all these new tests and stuff. So again, I think that's a big part. Um, when I was in patient facing roles initially and sort of, um, you know, testing the waters, whether I wanted to go back to it sort of in between roles, um, one of the biggest things for me and, and still is, uh, was through industry as well, are those, and I think I've heard this from, from others as well, but those aha moments, it's those sort of when a patient or their families, you know, truly really get the value of their family history or the genetic information and realize that with that sort of without it, they can't or couldn't have made truly informed decisions. That was huge for me. And if I didn't get that, I feel like it's almost, I didn't do my job. And so having that with, with, it's almost like a checkpoint for me is like that great sort of, I did my job. 
it was good. It, regardless of what happens after the session, they understood, they took something out of the session, I helped, right? And so that's sort of a big thing for me. It's funny, I get goosies whenever I talk about it. But yeah, it's, it's almost just, like teachers say that, like when the is. students get it, that aha moment, like that's what you're talking about, but in this yeah. healthcare setting where they understand it and they get the impact of it. It's exactly. like boom, boom, like it's, it's exactly. two points there. And so now it's like the fact that you get it means I'm okay with whatever decision you make. I don't care whatever it is, that I know that you made based on what information you understood, right? That is the, the piece for me. That was huge for me. Um, later on, um, sort of moving from that patient facing um, roles, uh, one of the things I realized is that I'm making an impact, but it's so small. If you think about it in the clinical world, you see what, on a busy day, eight patients, right? That's a busy day. Um, so on average, you want to see something between four to six patients a day, and that will be a good day so that you have time for other things. For me, what I realized is that if I talk to providers, I educate providers, I reach out to them and teach them how to identify those patients and how to talk to patients, because we all know in the medical world, it's really hard to not only sort of dumb things down, if you may, but also just having that conversation with patients is hard. And so working with providers to not only identify those who can benefit from it, uh, but also talking to them about how and what to order and understanding those results, I could have had so much more impact, which is why I ended up in the industry role. Um, and so that was a big reward for me, just understanding how, because I had a provider, um, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times we've talked about this, that they see, on a, an OBGYN can see around 41 patients a day. It's wild. Imagine if I see three providers in that day, right? The, the, just the impact. So that was a big, big benefit for me. So all of these things, and then of course, just again, the, the stories and being able to touch people, that's, we all have that as well. But like Tiana said, you know, empathy and all these things, it, it really is a double-edged sword, um, especially for me as well. Um, and I've had a lot of challenges and I think those are, are sort of vast, similar to any other, I feel like medical roles and then some. Um, I think one issue that I can, you know, that, that you can likely all relate to honestly, um, is access to genetic counseling and testing. That was huge, especially working in an industry, just understanding and knowing that sort of hereditary care isn't as important than other things like diabetes or anything, it hurts, right? Like it's like, I, it's so, you can prevent so much and just by educating, right? And so just having that access issues, insurance coverage, knowing that a patient wants genetic testing or genetic care without being able to get it because affordability, insurance, whatever that may be, that was hard for me. And um, hopefully that bill goes through that's, that's currently exactly. trying to push because it's literally called access to genetic counseling. So yes. put a link in the show notes to learn more about that. Yeah, and I think it is getting better, uh, but we have such a long, long way to go. Um, so this is the, the first step. So I, I, we're all crossing fingers. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, in the industry thing, um, is being able to really, and I think you touched on it as well, Tiana, is that detachment, being able to detach yourself from, you know, that connection for, at least for me in the industry world, connection of who's paying you and the, the people on the other end, the people you're helping. We as genetic counselors have an obligation to the patients and industry. You have an obligation to providers and patients, right? The ability to counsel these patients without knowing the bias of who you're working with and removing that from the equation became a challenge. Um, a lot of the roles within the industry role has to do, you have to talk a lot about competition between laboratories. Nobody, I, I didn't, I, that's not what I signed up for, right? And so it was, it was a challenge for me. A lot of it was, at least in the industry role, to separate that. Um, and that was really weighing on me overall. But, um, lastly, and I think the most difficult thing for me, um, again, we touched on that, is empathy. And so it's the stories, the, the stories that the patients that you talk to, um, the experiences, the, you know, anything I do, any experience patients have, 
I'm one of those people who literally experiences it with them. And so um, it's been so bad to the point where kind of like, like you with Lexapro, I am medicated for anxiety as well and started to have concerns about going into depression from those issues because no matter what patients walked in the door, it, it came home with me. Um, and so, and it weighs on me and it will never go away, uh, good or bad, right? The good stories and the bad stories. But as we all know, it's very easy to keep holding on to those bad stories. Could I have done more? Did I fail this patient? Um, you know, did I, you know, what could I have done better with this provider, you know, to have helped identify this patient sooner? Did I fail them as well? All these different questions continuously come up in those roles. And I'm sure everybody has these same issues. Again, empathy is big. And so I think that was sort of one of those sort of final sort of pieces to challenges within that role for me that I almost feel like isn't addressed enough, so to speak. Um, yeah, and there isn't enough support for. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think especially for new grads that are joining the field in that capacity of, okay, now I'm working full time and, and for people in any kind of these roles, right? In the industry or in direct patient care, those first few hard cases, it's really hard to stop thinking about them when you get home. Yes. And it's, it's tough because I think that's something like, you know, we gloss over in grad school in general and, and talk about among our friends and everything. But, you know, my mom's a social worker. So for me, that was really helpful to be able to talk to her, obviously with HIPAA, right? You can't say certain things to people unless they're mm -hmm. your coworker at the same place. But for me to kind of say like, you know, can you help me process some of this counseling stuff? She only knows the genetics of just from hearing me going on and on about <laughs> genetics over the years, right? But as many of our family members do, right? Honorary degrees in genetics that kind of come with the territory of living with us. Yeah. But in terms of the counseling perspective, that was really helpful for me to be like, well, how do I process this when it's really tough, um, you know, information of people making decisions about, am I continuing this pregnancy? Am I not? Like, how can I process that with them? Because mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily genetics, right? But it's just human to human. Can I yeah. help you process all of this? Yeah. Now, just hearing all of, you know, these experiences that you guys have had, is there a specific turning point that you can think back to or an event that made you say, you know what, I, I might have to step back from this role and my, my position in the field is going to be a little bit different that the way that you're in the genetic counseling community, um, is there something that kind of was that either turning point or that final point where you said, okay, I'm going to have to transition away from this role. And mm. I imagine that was a tough decision too. It wasn't easy. Yeah. I, I can go first this time. Uh, um, I think for me, I mean, there's always some personal things obviously going on for all of us um, that, that we go through, but I can say that one of the biggest contributors uh, t for me, um, although not necessarily a specific event, I generally started feeling like I wasn't making as much of a difference, um, that I wasn't making my mark, so to speak, on the world as much as I truly felt that I wanted to. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure I can even sort of define what that is. Um, but the idea that, you know, when I started sort of illustrating, you know, with pen and paper, when, when I had you know, patients, you start drawing and I'm a very visual person. Um, and so talking through things and drawing things for patients was sort of, I was getting more and more, even with providers, more and more and more about these sort of aha moments we talked about. Um, you know, I realized that I can sort of, even though I might have that burnout, that I'm not making a difference, that something there is telling me I'm not really motivated enough, that you know I can do more, what is it? Those sort of illustrating the art, the those kinds of things that I know I've always been drawn to, um, sort of made me realize that, um, and I've done marketing stuff as well within um, my roles in industry as well, but I sort of realized that I can use my creative side um, and combine it with my genetic counseling background and make an incredible impact. I don't have to give up 
all that I know and all my history in the genetics world, but having that transition and moving away will be healthier for me um, than staying and starting to hate that career. I didn't want that to happen. And so, you know, lo the love for genetics, the love for helping people, regardless of what way it would be, whether it's to inspire them through art or through educational material they can actually read and understand, um, you know, that was my motivator to make that change. I can truly say that since that change, I, I cannot, I cannot even describe how liberating that was to make that decision. I'm not saying this was easy. It was hard <laughs> to make that decision because it is, you've worked 10 years in a profession. You've done so much. You've, you know, shed tears. You've, there's, you know, anxiety that we talk about the, the empathy, the stories you take, even the rewarding moments, all these things you're thinking of leaving behind. What does that mean? Every, you know, I went through that as well, but I can truly say that making that decision and I wasn't alone. I had support. Um, making that decision was honestly the best thing I've ever done for, for myself. So, you know, I think a lot of it is, is really that sort of making that mark and being able to make that impact without necessarily leaving everything behind. Yeah, I think it, it's it's weighing out both of those sides and saying, yeah. okay, well, at the end of the day, it's got to be what's best for you and your family. Like, exactly. you know, that's what has to come first because it's like, you know, put your oxygen mask on first before others. Like that concept yep. of you you can't really truly help people if you're if you're not in a good position. I think you know mentally and physically and in, in so many different ways to be able to really give back um, in that capacity because you, you have you have to be at a certain level to be able to yep. give that. Um, Tiana, does that resonate with you just in terms of like the process, if it was similar for you? Yeah, it, I mean, there's, of course, you know, specific circumstances that came about that I won't get into detail in, but ultimately, um, there's a few things that I can highlight and point out in my experience of why I decided to transition away. So one of them is I distinctly remember having a moment where I had to come home from work and I was like totally dissociated from like everything. And that's so like unlike me and I'm like getting a little bit emotional about it because it, it just like caught me by surprise. Like I never expected any of this to happen. I never expected to experience burnout at all. Sorry. Um, you know, we talk about it all the time in school, or we see research about it all the time in the field, but you never think that it's going to happen to you until it does. <laughs> but I actually read some statistics in preparation that um, there's maybe a study from like 2016 that over 40% of GCs in the field experienced burnout or were having feelings of burnout. And there was a more recent stat from, I think, maybe 2020 that was like 57%. So that's a really high number and how much of that is compounded Crazy. from the pandemic, you know, that also added so many layers to, to life and to the profession and just not even our own profession in isolation, just the world um, to sort through. But I remember, you know, having these feelings and experiencing the start and decline of burnout. And I was scrolling through LinkedIn and I came across Nira's post that <laughs> she was a genetic counselor <laughs> who is going to school and learning graphic design. And I was like, oh my God, there's somebody else out there who experienced what I'm experiencing and is like in a very similar point of like where they want to go and where they want to transition into their path. And that also for me was liberating to see that other people have done it too. It's not just me. And I think that there's something so important to be said about having a community and a sense of not feeling isolated or stigmatized for even making these choices, because I'm not going to lie, I did feel embarrassed and I did feel ashamed for even considering, you know, after all the time and money and effort that goes into getting to this point of wanting to even move away from that, it's a hard decision to make. And it's not one that I think either of us really made lightly at all, um, but it's been freeing to make that choice. Yeah, and and Tiana, I want 
to tell you that people listening right now, there are some people that are like, oh my gosh, I am not the only one. And so the way you felt of seeing Nira's post and then connecting with her of like, wow, this could be, you know, a career shift. And people are having that moment right now of hearing your experience and being like, wow, you know, this is exactly how I've been feeling. So you're, you're having this impact on people. And I just want to say thank you so much for just opening up at, to this level of just sharing the experiences that you've had, because it is resonating with people like in this moment and it, it's a tough decision to make. And I think when I do see things about burnout, it's talked about more in like a clinical sense kind of thing where, you know, we've been talking about like these studies and we'll link to those two studies that Tiana mentioned in the show notes. Um, also dnatoday.com if that's easier for you, but it's very different hearing a personal perspective yeah. from someone that's experienced it. Right. We, we see this in our, in, in the genetic counseling field, right? We hear, oh, statistics, this many people are, you know, have this condition or are a carrier of this condition or something, but then you hear an interview or something with a patient advocate and it's so different, right? You're like, wow, yes. this one person's life. And that's what you guys are doing for burnout right now. I think in just in terms of like that experience and knowing that it's okay to say, I either need to take a pause on this or I need to do a shift within genetics or a shift where you're taking these skills and bringing them into what could be considered a new field, but you're bringing that over. And I think that's really important because there's so many skills in genetic counseling that's so versatile too. Yeah. Well, and if I could too, honestly, first of all, hearing that that I inspired you. I, I, it's amazing. So thank you. And I'm really glad I did. And I hope, I really hope this episode does that for more because I honestly think there are so many more that, because it's so stigmatized and I just, I want to make sure that people understand that not only this decision isn't taken lightly and it, Making it isn't easy. It, it, it honestly was one of the hardest things I've had to make. Um, but truthfully, not doing it, not going through that wasn't only going to hurt myself, but it was going to, it started impacting how I work. It started impacting the difference I make in other people's lives. And if I, I stayed and started and continued to, to work even with that lack of motivation, that you know, voice in the back of my head saying, you need to move on, something is going on, this isn't working for you, let's figure something out. That voice impacts everything. And if you fight through it and give in to stigma or what other people start might say, you're gonna hurt yourself more than you know. And so I urge people truly to just sit with themselves and truly value it. If you do have or ever that cro that thought crossed your mind, evaluate it. Don't ignore it. You may not get to the same conclusion and that's fine. Whatever conclusion you get to is your conclusion and that's perfectly fine, but ignoring it would hurt you. So just don't, don't deny the fact that there are those thoughts if they're there. That's, I guess that's my point. Yeah, I, I think that's a very astute point. And, and we've talked about how, you know, we wish that grad schools in general and maybe even like, you know, the conferences that we attend, you know, to make it a little bit past that grad school phase, but, you know, ha hasn't necessarily addressed burnout to the capacity and the depth that we would like to have seen, um, you know, especially with how it affects mental health and just people's overall life and just how, how they're feeling with that and then being able to provide quality patient care when you're feeling burnt out is, is very difficult. I, I don't, I don't think it's possible really if you're at that certain stage of burnout, but you know, going along with this, is there something that you felt like in the moment or now looking back that you're like, I wish I had certain resources or I wish like, you know, different organizations and companies would provide X, Y, Z or something along those lines, um, or even professional organizations. Like there's so many different avenues where I feel like there could be support, but I don't know, like, what would that have looked like in a dream world for you guys? What did you really need to reach to that wasn't there? So, um, I think, you know, when it comes to resources, um, I almost feel like that's a loaded question. It is um, just because there is, 
I think all of us feel like there's always something missing, no matter how much you have in an industry. Um, I think there's always something we can improve. So by having said that, um, there's sort of, I guess three main thing co main things come to mind when I think about resources or things that may have could have helped in the past um, going through this. Um, I think having an open mind is at the top of that list, um, mainly with things like not just from colleagues and other genetic counselors, but management and leadership. Um, has to have that understanding. I think we are, especially after COVID, get ourselves so focused on the role we're doing and the things that we're doing, what we need to do for our career, that we forget everything else. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. We want to do the best that we can within the role that we're in, and that's, that's important as well. But by forgetting other things, like supporting your employees, your colleagues, um, you know, having sort of this understanding the value of sort of balance is crucial. Balancing that work life, um, I think it's really, really important. Uh, bringing that topic up, and I think we talked about it earlier in school and discussing that possibility of burnout and that coming up, that being an issue that people do experience, I think would have been so helpful for me. Um, I think even knowing to expect it may have allowed me to sort of balance work and self-care a little bit different probably. Um, and again, hindsight 2020, right? We all know that. Um, but I think, you know, sort of even, even approaching work differently could have, could have helped, I think. So having that knowledge in school, I think is crucial. So um, programs bringing that in is, is a good strategy in my opinion. Um, the other thing I was thinking about too is um, I think, and I sort of bring that in my own experience too, but um, I think genetic counseling roles should have and offer a combination of tasks that not only, the, the, they need to combine GC role tasks, right? The genetics, the research, the, the writing, the patient care, all that different stuff that we already are doing, that we're trained to do but also the availability of other ta tasks that are not necessarily GC driven. Anywhere from, again, it can be creating collateral, that's genetics, but it's still focusing other, other ways. Creating collateral, working on advocacy, right? Um, writing blogs for the practice, um, you know, teaching in grad schools, even creating and running workshops, kind of like what you're doing, right? Podcasts, whatever it is, things that can be offered through your workplace already rather than us having to go look for it elsewhere that in and of itself adds so much stress already because we are looking for it elsewhere that's time that's effort that that's anxiety am i going to get in am i going to get you know is my social going to be good right all these different things that we have to do with it if that were something that was offered within a genetic counseling role, role I think would have helped so much when it comes to burnout because you're not solely focusing eight hours a day to 10 hours a day, depending on your role, on genetics, right? Genetics, patient care, whatever it is that you do in your role as a genetic counselor, right? So I think that's a huge thing that, um, that I think would have helped. And then um, I think, you know, applying or having these support groups um, I think, again, we touched on that earlier, is having these people to talk about. We all have our personal people, you know, our partners, our, you know, parents, our therapists, whoever it would be that we already are talking or thinking of talking to, um, even a journal, right? I think those things are always there, but having a dedicated, you know, place to go to with people who are going through the same thing. I mean, we say that to our patients all the time, right? Trying to connect them with families who are going through the same thing. Why are we not doing that to ourselves? Yeah, take our own advice a little bit, right? Exactly, yeah. right? So I think that's a big thing as well, is just being able to create that sort of support group, whether it's a SIG or whatever it might be, some kind of support group outside of the GC role or the, the you know, NSGC even. Um, to just have that support, to know that we're not the only one, right? We are, we have a community. And um, I'm surprised that our field does not have built-in supervision. I know I mentioned yes. my mom's a social worker, 
part of That's what great. her job is and she's well into her career you know i'm 28 she's my mom do the math <laughs> so you know she's been in this career for a long time and she still has supervision where her and someone else meet and they go over cases together of coworkers of okay what are you doing with this and and that and how are you handling this and separating it from yourself and, and a dedicated person and that's part of her work hours yeah. so she works at a private practice so you know but that is the same case when she worked in a hospital previous in her career i'm using her as an example but the social work field has this built in i don't know why genetic counseling doesn't have that i am the only genetic counselor in my office i have to rely on reaching out to friends like you guys and other people you know really good friends from my class from grad school and especially the beginning of my career especially when we were in covid but when we did get together virtually or, or in person socially distanced and all that like we would talk about things and well i have this really hard case and this and that and we would process with each other so we kind of made it happen within our friends but i am shocked and, and i really hope that this can be a shift in our field where we will have supervision built in just like we have other things where if you are a supervisor to a genetic counseling grad student, you have to do certain CEUs and, and this and that, that I think seems to be newish, but maybe I just wasn't aware of it. But, you know, I, I'm just shocked that we don't have that. Yeah. And hopefully if someone's listening to this years later, they'll be like, oh, we have that now, I guess in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if not, we should open one. There you yeah, go. I'm like, I don't know who we need to talk to <laughs> to make that happen. I don't know. Maybe the president of NSGC, ABGC, something like that. Um, but yes, Tiana, other thoughts to add on to that? Um, so I'll start out by saying that it's kind of hard to ask for more when so many are spent from the pandemic yeah. in general. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we probably wish exist and maybe someday they will and hopefully they will. Um, but it is hard to ask for more, but I think it still needs to be asked. Um, I know when we were in grad school, we had like a peer supervision type of group where we were able to process cases with a uh, more senior GC who was you know, outside of the institution to talk through them. And that's great. And that's wonderful. And for some people, it does work and it might help foster some of those relationships, you know, during their training of who are people that I can turn to for support if you know, my back is against the wall and maybe I don't have that support wherever I'm at or wherever I'm working. Um, I think there might be something more there where we could try to help students, current students, build coping skills. So that way, when they do enter the workforce, they are prepared for it. Because we know research has <laughs> supported and shown that we are at higher risk for burnout. And so it kind of maybe starts there of, how do we train ourselves to be better equipped to handle it if it does happen? Um, and I don't know if this exists in our field or not, um, but I think this more harkens back to what you're talking about of having like a supervision, but really like peer support groups outside of our own hospital systems where either you are talking to somebody who maybe is a mental health professional or somebody in the field, whoever wants to, take on that role and, and yeah. be a support for other people by all means. Hey, um, guys. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, also going back just for a moment of current students too, of trying to also build and encourage and maybe support some of those relationships too, whether it's a mental health provider that's on campus that can really help the students process these cases and that information if they do need additional support and maybe just establishing that relationship for them anyway um and outside of the field once you're once you're in workforce and going through it still continuing those relationships in a either private setting or wherever you're able to get that help i would love to see organizations wherever people are working companies that's just part of having a genetic counseling job, you get coverage for mental health services so that it can be very expensive. And usually it's hard to find someone in network. Usually those providers are booked up. You, you, you really, you yeah. can't find someone, especially now. I mean, since COVID, it, there's been such an uptick in people going into therapy, which is awesome. But then yeah. on the other side, you don't have enough 
therapist to be filling yes. that demand. So then it becomes even more expensive. People go out of network and then it's really expensive to pay out of pocket for therapy. It could be, you know, a hundred, hundreds a session, depending on, you know, um, yeah. if they have a sliding scale, some places offer that. But regardless, it can be very expensive. So I think that's something I would too, like right? to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think all of that, that being able to have out of network providers and be reimbursed for that or some kind of thing, I think is, you know, would be awesome for companies and organizations to provide. Um, another aspect that I know we've kind of been talking about, but I just wanted to give the opportunity, if you guys had any other advice for either students, current genetic counselors that might be, you know, experiencing burnout or contemplating a career change, I think for the current students, that's a little bit more of just what should you be mindful of going into the career. But for those that are listening to this, like, oh my gosh, yes, like this is all resonating with me. I, I think I am experiencing burnout and, you know, is there any advice kind of looking back on, on that time? Um, I think I'll let Mira take this one first. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, so as far as advice on how to handle this, um, I think there's a lot of different ways and I think everybody sort of processes these things differently. Um, I can say for me, um, again, one of the biggest things, and I think for all of us genetic counselors having, you know, that empathy piece, that sort of emotional aspect of being a genetic counselor, that counseling part of it, um, I think being able to talk through those feelings um, with somebody who might understand, somebody you're comfortable with, and that doesn't necessarily mean a therapist. For me, it's my husband, right? For me, it's my best friend and my mom. Those are the people I talk to, to sort of process my emotions and process what I'm going through. That's huge piece for me. So having somebody you trust to just say, I need you to sit here, stay silent, let me get it out and then we can talk it out. That's huge for me. One of the other things I think, um, not everybody is one of those people who talks. Um, journaling is huge too. So there are, so many different journals out there that you can use ones that have prompts in them if that's what you need and ones that are just blank just take a pen to paper and just write it out process those things you need to ask yourself those questions if you're starting to feel like something is going on regardless of whether you're already in school and still in school and having these thoughts in school in grad school uh, five years later two years later 15 years later it doesn't matter when if those thoughts start coming in and you start seeing that motivation starts being questioned you have to ask yourself those sort of questions of where those come from is it truly a motivation was there any kind of what you're asking was there a specific event why is that event there why did that cause was there a trigger are there other triggers is there something personal that i was going through at that time that maybe impacted my work that kind of stuff um sort of what other stressors outside of work do i have that might have impacted my work my my feelings am i still passionate about genetic counseling right am i passionate about this aspect of genetic counseling or sort of do i need to maybe i can change instead of getting out of the field completely would moving within different sort of um uh, fields within the genetic counseling world right um, specialties, would that help, right? Am I passionate somewhere else? Maybe I don't want to see patients. Maybe I want to do research. Maybe I want to do patient, after, whatever it might be, start thinking about that and then sort of start thinking about what are my transferable skills? Are there skills that I'm already doing now that can transfer elsewhere, whether it's within the genetic counseling world or outside of it? And then make that list of what could that be, right? What am I passionate about outside of genetic counseling? Is there something else? Again, for me, it was a lot of art I, that constantly came back into my um, sort of my thoughts is, can I do art and combine that? I've always been a doodler. I over, I've always, you know, drawn and, you know, done that. So can I combine those things without necessarily having to give up completely on the genetic counseling role? Ask yourself those questions um, and then talk to professionals and find those people who've also been through that again we're now creating that start of hey we've been there come talk to us 
please, I'm going to say that right here. Please, if there's <laughs> anybody going through this, find us on LinkedIn, find us on, you know, social media, anywhere. Link in the just, show notes. You guys can find their LinkedIn. There you go. <laughs> um, reach out to us to be able to ask those questions. You know, I know for me, and I don't want to speak to Tiana, but I'm sure she's as well, but we're happy to, to talk to you in person and have that sort of personalized experience with you. Yeah, I think that's huge. Yeah. I think just being able to look at that and, and I think an aspect that you brought up too is that your skills can transfer elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot that kind of the reverse that even doing this podcast really helped me become a genetic counselor because I, you know, being a patient facing genetic counselor, it's kind of like interviewing people. Like you're taking their family history, that feels like interviewing people. So for me, it was that direction. But for others, taking certain skills and saying, wow, this really transfers well into this other role. Like you think about all the things that being a genetic counselor, like being a teacher, that counseling part, the research part, uh, the writing aspect and the communication, there's just so much that goes into it that, you know, you hone in grad school and then as you become a genetic counselor, but that can be used elsewhere, even like within science communication, like, you know, um, you know, I would love to hear from both of you kind of, what types of roles and career paths that you're thinking about right now? And, you know, Nira, I know we heard that you're, you're working more on the graphic design part. Tiana, I would love to hear kind of what you've thought about for like the future. And if there's people listening that, you know, are like, oh, I think Tiana would be a great fit for us or something like, yeah. you know, what kind of roles <laughs> you're looking for, where you feel like your skills can be applied and where it's going to be a better fit for you. Yeah, so I also am very much a creative person, and I've come to the realization that I really like creative problem solving. I love drawing. I do. I never really pursued it in a professional capacity. Would I love to do that? Yes, but I think that I'm more interested in a field that's called user experience and user interface design. And so the, the best way that I could try to describe what that is, is if you've ever used like a general app or a website and you absolutely hated it, that is poor user experience design. <laughs> um, so the whole point of it is to make apps, websites, digital products, easy to use and enjoyable to use. And so I would love to take that passion that I have and that I'm developing and growing skill set in and apply it actually to the genetics world, the genetics healthcare space. I think that there's so much that could be done there. Um, and I just think that it would be really fascinating to try to see how can we improve products for other providers, other geneticists, genetic counselors? How can we improve products for our patients? Maybe some of our patients who have certain sets of disabilities or different abilities because of their genetic conditions, how can we try to cater products to make them better? for those yes. people. Um, so I think that that would be a really interesting space to explore. Um, I think that there may be some other GCs or people who have transferred out of the field and are doing more similar things to that out there. Um, and I would love to connect with them too. So that way yes. I can see <laughs> your brains. Yeah. But that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. I feel like a lot of labs could use you. Not going to name mm -hmm. names, but I feel like there's some labs where <laughs> the portals are not as easy to use. No. Nope. Sometimes they're beautiful, but the you're like, okay, I'm looking for these three but features the, and they don't yes. have it, right? You go to search a patient and you're like, I can't tell which of from the drop down menu is the recent one or something like, you know, just little things like that, that really change how you operate. I think, you know, a lot of, yeah. a lot of labs could use you, Tiana. I think that would be Aww. really helpful. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, especially for someone that's so organized and just, just, I think the way your brain works and everything of, of taking in like the full experience there, but then looking at that little details and ah, if we fix this, it might make things a little easier color code or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, Nira, anything to add on to your journey and next steps? Yeah. I mean, um, I think again, sort of, um, I think being able to think outside the box, being able to break down complex topics, issues into simpler terms, that problem solving, I think, um, is sort of, again, transferable in many ways. Specifically for me, I think um, that background in genetic counseling, being able to 
have those interpretive skills, having those people skills, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes helps me as a graphic designer create those items or things with that patient, with that person, provider, whoever the audience is in mind. And so I'm hoping again to create sort of interpretive art or, you know, educational collateral or, you know, sort of again, websites, those kinds of things, design those things with the idea of simplifying, of answering the need that you have. Um, so different like visual aids too. Would you add that to exactly. the list? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's awesome, especially with how fast genetics changes, which we document on the show a lot yep. that, you know, having aids that actually go with that and they're not super outdated and everything. I think that's, that's fabulous. And, and to be able to tailor that to certain labs, certain clinics, yeah. like, you know, there, there's differences there. If you have a clinic that looks at just Williams syndrome or something like they may need graphics that don't exist, um, yeah. you know, kind of thing. But I can't thank you both enough for coming on the show and just being so, so open about your experiences. It is scary coming on a podcast and talking about a hard time in your life. I want to acknowledge that. Um, and that especially talking about something that's in your field. I think it's a little different when we have patient advocates come on that are talking about how hard their diagnostic odyssey was and different yeah. aspects there. But I think it is a different angle when you're talking about a lot of issues that are within the field, but you are coming from a place of, you know, we want to be able to provide resources for people so that there is less burnout. And so people can acknowledge it when it's happening and say, okay, this is happening to me. How can I either limit this or say, you know what? I don't know if this is a good fit for me. Maybe I'm yeah. better off in, in a different area within genetics or taking those skills and bringing them to, you know, an entirely new type of career. So I think you've just shared so much insightful information and just your own experiences. It just goes a very long way. So thank you on behalf of the people listening that were like, wow, I've never heard someone talk about their burnout. Now mm -hmm. they have. Absolutely. Happy to. And again, thank you. Anybody who has any questions, uh, feel free to reach us. Definitely. And yes. I just want to remind you guys, um, yes, definitely reach out there. LinkedIn, um, handles and, uh, URL is there in the show notes also at dnatoday.com. And don't forget, because I almost did, because I'm so yeah. in this conversation <laughs> for people watching on the video, if you're not hop on to YouTube or, uh, go to our website to uh, look at the embedded video, but, um, gorgeous art by Nira. And so Thank if you, you would like to have one of her gorgeous art pieces, then you want to enter a giveaway so you can win something off of her Etsy. Um, so just head over, head over to our social media. We're at DNA Today Podcast on all platforms. Um, our Instagram and LinkedIn is probably the best places to enter. Um, but I'll throw X on the list, aka old Twitter <laughs> or new Twitter. Um, and uh, maybe we'll put on threads too because we're just exploring all the new socials. Um, but yes, <laughs> thank you both so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks. You. Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics.